Welcome everyone to today's webinar, a COVID-19 panel discussion. Actionable insights from the C-suite to the front lines. I'm Aliyah Pavla with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you use to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenters. Kelly Larrabee Robkey, the Vice President of Thought Leadership for BD. Becky Fox, the Vice President and System CNIO for Atrium Health System. Susan Mashney, the Vice President and Chief Pharmacy Officer of Mount Sinai Health System. Michael Meekins, Director of Pharmacy Operations for Avera McKennan Hospital and University Health Center. Russ Funk, Chief Executive Officer of Banner Health Pharmaceutical Operations. And David Webster, Associate Director of Pharmacy Operations and Assistant Professor of Clinical Community and Preventative Medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Kelly to begin today's presentation. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We really appreciate your joining and I think you're going to really appreciate the insights and the perspectives that our panel has to offer today. And um, we know that we're in unprecedented times in healthcare, we're rising to the challenge. And I think we're gonna have a very robust and rich conversation with these leaders from across the country, from different practice perspectives, be it academic medicine, rural healthcare, metropolitan healthcare, and also um, we have pharmacy and nursing representatives and the partnership that pharmacy and nursing um, has is very important to patient care. So look forward to hearing from Becky, Russ, Susan, Michael, and David today and sharing with you their experiences and insights, um, what they've learned, what they'll do differently um, next time around. And um, we look forward to a robust Q&A after that discussion. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have several questions that we have pre-prepared and we're gonna start off with question one. If we could advance the slides, please, um, to question one. I'll go ahead and, and tee this up for our panel. And um, Susan, Mike, and Becky, would love to hear from you first on question one. The crisis response efforts are in action all over our country with healthcare systems engaging in new ways to increase capacity of beds, of supplies, of healthcare professionals that have the knowledge and expertise to support care delivery needs of COVID-19 patients. So my question to the panel to get us started is how did your organizations utilize your existing disaster preparedness plans to address these unprecedented events? And how did you, or even did you modify those plans that you had for disaster preparedness to best address the emerging needs specific to COVID-19? And Susan, I'd like to hear from you first, if you don't mind. Sure, so, uh, you know, at Mount Sinai Health System, we instituted pretty much immediately our disaster plan, um, similar to the things that we've used in, in previous circumstances. And um, we've discussed, you know, as a team, some of the issues that we had, because usually when we when we bring together a command center, it's something that's gonna be an acute situation. And what uh, we immediately brought it up in that acute scenario where we actually physically set up command centers um, in our home office environment, we did separate our teams into small groups. Um, but however, quickly we realized that that, that was an issue with respect to um, social distancing, which wasn't actually a word when that happened. Um, so I think the first thing that we had to morph into a new circumstance was to make that command center virtual after many of our leaders became ill with COVID or had been, had been uh, exposed and had to quarantine. Um, so we moved quickly from having a physical command center to a virtual command center. 
Um, and also we, all, we morphed into a scenario where we knew it was going to be not the acute situation that we were used to dealing with uh, in other instances. So folks often in New York referred back to Hurricane Sandy where it was something that came and went in a relatively short period of time. We knew that this crisis was going to go on for um, quite a long period of time. So we had to move into a more long-term mode. Um, we set up more virtual workplaces for all of our staff and um, really started pushing um, early, early and rapidly into a telehealth environment um, for our organization. I think also um, we realized that at each of the sites in the hospitals, we were also going to have to set up some virtual command also um, in that some of our leaders at the sites became ill too. So um, we, and, and we had to send teams out to respond to that. So we knew initially uh, that it was going to be a long-term um, process. I think what we didn't know was what the impact of the illness on our on our providers was going to be uh, to that process. Um, but we did eventually just move it into a more of a tele situation. When we talk about command centers, and this was a common thread as the panel prepped for our discussion today, the theme of longevity came up. And um, when you looked at, at your original disaster preparedness plans, and Becky, I'm going to tee it up for you next, um, how did those actually um, parallel and support and fortify what you needed to do? And did you plan for your command centers in a disaster scenario similar to this? Um, did those plans call for a longevity of operations of the um, command center. I'm just curious what the experience was um, for you down in Charlotte at Atrium Health. Yeah, so I, th I think Mike had even mentioned it was, you know, most of the times when any of us face any, any type of natural disaster, it is for a few days or maybe it's a week or two. Um, it's, it's nothing that we're looking for in a, lo a long-term strategy, but all of us have had to quickly do that. So not only move your remote, uh, you know, take care of the masses of your teammates and make sure you're preparing as best you can for your patients, but then you've got to figure out how do you have that operational structure ready to go and how, to, how do they um, make the right decisions for the organization. So we had to really look at, even though at Atrium we have multiple different facilities, um, we did learn very quickly that we did not have even, there was an opportunity to standardize some of those practices. So um, one facility, for example, we might find that they were doing some manual reports. They had automated reports, but they were manually creating a second type of, of report for a different piece of information to make different decisions on. And so what we quickly realized is, you know, we need to make sure that as we stand up command centers, both as an organization level and then also as an, at an individual facility level, we need to make sure that everyone's got the same data, the same um, uh, format of how they get the data, um, where that data is located so that everyone's making the best decisions as appropriate for their facilities. Um, and, and of course, doing all that in a quick fashion, in a fluid fashion. Um, and, you know, I know we're going to talk a little bit later about how that made an impact to some of our cultural changes that we've all experienced. Um, but what we recognized is data is the key that's going to help drive all our decisions. And we need all of our operational command centers to have the best data, the quickest data, and, and they need to have it in a standardized way. Right. Mike, I'm interested in your perspective, and if you could talk a little bit about how your command center operated within this um, pandemic and, and the care that you've delivered to your communities. I'd like for you to maybe tee up your perspective, which is a discussion around your, um, your geographic lo location, your um, footprint within the community, the span that you cover. Um, and then interested to hear how um, your command center operated as it relates to your existing disaster preparedness plan. Yeah, so our footprint within our organization covers around 72,000 square miles within the upper Midwest. So we're predominantly rural, um, and from a command center perspective, uh, we had an overall institutional command center um, that was initially set up um, and met and discussed uh, things from an organizational perspective, but then also had uh, individual facility command centers to be able to discuss specific information that was important and really affected the day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour 
uh, aspects within all of our own individual operations, and that ranging from screening protocols to visitors to PPE and things of that nature that really we needed to be able to react to a little bit more acutely. From an overall healthcare perspective, um, we were really we're really fortunate in that we have a very uh, established telehealth program traditionally, and our telehealth serves around 500 different partner facilities in 32 states. So we were able to pivot relatively quickly um, as we looked at how do we need to transition our care. And I think that telehealth ability really allowed our overall organizational command center to be um, ahead of the game a little bit quicker than maybe I think some of us even would have anticipated just because of the connectivity and the infrastructure that was already established. So because of that, um, we learned a, a great deal from, from our telehealth um, colleagues on really how to be able to work virtually uh, efficiently and effectively, which I think really contributed to our overall success or the success that we perceived um, that we had as we not only set up all of our um, incident command centers, but um, then after the first two to three weeks, we kind of all were hit with the gravity that, you know, this is something that we're going to be dealing with for quite a while, and we really need to learn to, to try to pace ourselves um, a little bit better, um, because as was mentioned before, typically with, with our incident command centers, they're, they're set up really predominantly on a facility-by-facility -facility basis as nece necessary, predominantly for natural disasters. So, for example, we had a tornado in, uh, in September of 2019 that ripped through our facilities, <clears throat> excuse me, in Sioux Falls. Our incident command center was set up for three days. Um, our incident command center structure has currently been functioning for over 14 weeks. So that, I think, speaks to how after two to three weeks, really, we all had to step back and take a deep breath and kind of reconfigure how we went about to be able to make it through uh, to, to make everything sustainable. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask you all a question as well about um, we've been talking about pivot and pivoting fast and, and pivoting with direct intention and having to scale on certain operational changes or paradigm shifts in care delivery. Um, I heard you use the example of telehealth, Mike, and, you know, I think we can all agree that telehealth has played a major role and um, had an impact on, on how care is delivered and managed in, in the current environment. But I want to touch on something that's very important because I think all three of you have been challenged in different ways. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing from Russ on this too. But talk a little bit about um, your surge capacity and how you plan for it, how you addressed it, and um, was it as intense as you expected and for how long? And any insights that you think might be helpful to share with our clinician community of practice. And Becky, I'm going to start with you. Um, yeah, I think that we're all going to look back on this experience of COVID and just still be in awe that we have all um, made it through. Because <laughs> um, I don't think that anyone has expected it to to go on as long or you know, you're just continually amazed at both the resiliency of the leadership, resiliency of our staff and of our patients and our communities, all trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, we've, some of the initiatives I think that helped us uh, still feel that we were, you know, because sometimes in, in those really intense moments of chaos, and you know, at Atrium we've been very blessed because there has been um, a lot of efforts that have not had the same numbers of impact. Now, you know, we continue to see spikes just like other areas in the country and this will continue to move, but um, we haven't had the same um, experience where we planned for what I call the apocalypse, but we did not experience that. We did not have to put things in place. And so it's made us be very appreciative of what we were able to do and yet at the same time reflect on our resiliency and understand what do we need to do differently when we get the next surge um, and, and how do we make a difference going forward. I will share with you, we've had to think outside of the box. So 
we leveraged baby monitors, and that was actually a lesson learned that we, we learned from, from folks that um, actually, I believe it was Mount Sinai and a couple of the other organizations in New York, and then of course in California there were some organizations that shared that experience with us. Um, and so that's what one of the things that I've been very appreciative of is there's just been a great sharing and, and networking, and people will take a quick phone call or a text or a quick email and help the other organizations move things along to make sure that we're doing the right thing for all of our patients. So, um, you know, some of those initiatives have been thinking outside the box. Normally, you know, six months ago, our privacy leaders would have said, no, we can't put baby monitors on a unit. But now because of visitor restrictions, we can do that. We had to quickly stand up all of our virtual. Um, and I know others, you know, um, other organizations have had to quickly stand up their virtual as well. We also stood up a virtual hospital so we could take COVID patients who were positive and put them at home, but have um, a robust technology reach out so we connect with them via texting. We monitor them by looking at the content of that texting, and then we have a paramedicine program that touches base and will actually go to their home and check on them if we need to, but that way we were able to keep volumes of patients out of the organization um, and keep them, you know, let them recover at home. So those are just kind of a couple things that we have reflected on the resiliency of, um, and the resiliency came from being able to do some of those successes along the way. Um, and then, and really, and our successes came from the partnerships that we had with both our vendors and our other colleagues across the United States and around the world. Um, and so I think we're all going to look back and say, man, I really don't want to do this again, but we, but we learned a lot in it. And I know we'll continue, you know, even through this opportunity today of speaking, we'll continue to pass these things forward um, because we know ultimately it makes a better impact on all healthcare um, into the future. Thanks, Becky. And I, I really love where, where you were going in terms of the culture and maintaining the culture and celebrating your successes along the way through virtual communication, because healthcare is a very engaging, dynamic practice, and we need to keep those connections. It's what we do. Before we leave this question, I'd like to give Susan an opportunity to, to talk about the surge um, within her practice setting, um, because I, I believe it's quite different. So, Susan, I'll let you touch on that briefly. Yeah, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, we did, I think, in New York experience um, somewhat of the apocalypse. So, um, you know, the patients came fast and furious to us, and all those areas where we considered surging initially, we, you know, we basically became, within a couple of weeks, our hospitals became 100% COVID. Um, we had intensive care beds in um, any place from endoscopy to all of our PACUs, um, places that had maybe formerly been operating rooms, anything, any place that we had been able to care for patients with anesthesia or high touch um, became intensive care unit beds for um, for patients with COVID. Um, as anyone, as everyone saw, I'm sure on the news, we partnered we partnered with a group called Samaritan's Purse. Um, and we developed um, 68 beds and tents in Central Park. Um, even 12 ICU beds were part of those tents. Um, they came with portalettes and everything. It was um, really unbelievable that 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 was able to happen in such a quick quick period of time. Um, certainly, we had we put tents everywhere we could around our hospitals, but most of our hospitals are um, in Manhattan or in places where, you know, I tell people there's um, in our Queens Hospital, for example, you know, we've got um, the little local Greek restaurant, Dunkin' Donuts, the hospital, and then the bank. There wasn't a lot of room for the tent, um, so we had to fit in the nooks and crannies. We partnered with local hotels that allowed us to house patients that were uh, recuperating from COVID that didn't need to be in the hospital any longer. Um, we partnered with um, New York Housing Authority to help put homeless people in hotels um, with some nursing staff, and, and we also provided medications for those folks that were um, uninsured through um, our partnership with Dispensary of Hope. Those were all partnerships we didn't have before this crisis, and it was the way that we were able to maintain the numbers of patients that we were um, treating COVID across New York. Um, I think we even got to the point where we were putting up tents within St. John the Divine Church um, up in our St. Luke's or Morningside Hospital. Um, when we got to maximum capacity, and, and then um, luckily we were able to back off on that plan because it was going to be really um, taxing for our nursing staff. 
Um, so basically we had people uh, pretty much everywhere um, and we worked on surging um, three times a day. We met to talk about surge and surge capacity. Um, we had a couple floors of our Beth Israel Hospital, which was being um, actually sunsetted. We were getting ready to move into a new hospital that we're, that we're still building. Um, we had three floors that were being opened being utilized, um, not being utilized for healthcare, um, they were being utilized to film TV shows and, and movies. So we had to move those back into to become patient care areas again. Um, one day, I remember on the call, um, our poor nursing director said, well, we got 300 beds, but they're all in boxes, and there's six boxes per each bed. So we're going to need to bring some people down here to put beds together today. Um, and that was sort of the the mantra, we just pulled people in from everywhere that we could to do whatever needed to be done. So we had all the people from um, anyone that was in a non-clinical role within Mount Sinai Health System or our medical school um, came to the rescue. So we had medical students working as pharmacy interns. Um, we had um, people that um, worked in research and development, um, morphing things that had been other types of devices into ventilators. Um, putting together beds, um, it, and it was sort of just all hands on deck. Um, we actually also stood up a hospice service from our retail pharmacy so that we could send people home. Uh, hospice services were maxed out. They, didn't, they weren't able to see people in, in the homes as much as they liked because of lack of PPE. So we were able to send people home with our hospital at home service um, with the necessary drugs um, so that their family members could take care of them so they didn't need to die alone in the hospital if, if they didn't want to do that. Um, so it, it really was the apocalypse, um, but you know, it's um, now we're down to 4% COVID in our hospitals and, and life is getting a little more normal, um, but the surge was possible and uh, I'm really proud of the way that we did it. Thank you so much, Susan. Russ, I'm, I'm curious if you could briefly share with us um, your perspectives from, from your geographic area and then we're going to start getting into some of the details around um, what was going on logistically in terms of your supply, in terms of, of your, your healthcare areas, and um, some of the agencies you're, you've been working with. But Russ, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just give us a quick overview of, of how things went in your geographic location. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah just, just a couple of things uh, to add to the conversation here. Um, with one of the pieces that we have is we have about a six state area that we cover. And so different hospitals surged at different times. And so that helped us really have a lead hospital that helped us plan for some of the other facilities as we, uh, as we worked with uh, the organizations. But uh, some of the, one of the things that hasn't been talked about here is just working with the State Board of Pharmacy. Uh, we were able to get some technician um, exemptions so that supervision didn't have to be direct in room, but could be uh, remote supervision. And that helped us really look at, uh, you know, getting people separated out um, so that either technicians could work from home or work in more of a uh, social distancing perspective. And uh, that was a big piece of us, you know, really trying to work with the standpoint of how do we get everybody out and keep them safe as, as, best, as best as possible. Uh, because as part of the surge, one of the biggest things we really had to work with was the staff and that fear and uncertainty of walking in and am I gonna get exposed to COVID today? And uh, so we used as much uh, plexiglass and did internal construction as much as we could to help prevent um, that as, as COVID was starting and really looked at uh, the physical layout of the facilities and looked at how we could best protect and uh, take care of the individuals while conserving PPE, which was uh, definitely a goal of ours uh, to make sure that we can serve and use PPE in the most appropriate places. Thanks, Russ. Speaking of, of supplies and logistics and, and how um, there were challenges and opportunities throughout, um, I want to kind of pivot the conversation to more of an um, operational supply chain um, perspective. Um, McKinsey has a great report out that they released um, that where they identified multiple areas for immediate focus in customizing COVID-19 response at efforts. There's enough information out there where we're starting to, to see some signals in terms of best practice. Knowing what you knew previously and watching what happened across the country, how 
did reality vary from from what you your plans expected? And I'm going to start with Dave, because um, Dave, you mentioned that up in Rochester, you all had a couple of instances. One was around the development of a COVID-specific ICU, and the other was utilizing your existing um, automated dispensing cabinets um, in ways that allowed you to make the most of what you had and utilize existing um, infrastructure, technologies, to be innovative in process and practice. So Dave, I'd like for you to take it and, and just tell us a little bit about what you did with your PIXISs and also your um, ICU in Rochester. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, being in New York, uh, you know, obviously we were seeing what was going on. We were more apocalypse adjacent, I guess you would say, um, because we, we did expect the types of surges we were seeing in New York City uh, in Rochester, even though uh, it didn't quite get to that point. We needed to be prepared, and we were learning a lot from what we were hearing. There was a lot of great communication across the state, particularly out of New York City, uh, so we could be prepared. So one of the things, you mentioned a few of the things. I'll start with the ICU team. One of the things we did very early on as our COVID patient population started to grow uh, is our, our ICU team put together what we called our, our HIDU team, which is just our acronym for Highly Infectious Disease Unit. So all of the COVID positive units, whether ICUs or non-ICUs, uh, were essentially grouped into the same area. And this team's uh, task was to, to really do, do many things. One is they would uh, participate in virtual rounds every day uh, with these patients, uh, with the medical teams. Um, they were involved in developing new EMR order sets as we learned uh, that COVID patients, you know, require different types of needs. We were developing order sets as, as, we, uh, as we identified them. They developed and implemented many guidelines around managing shortages, um, going back and forth between fentanyl and hydromorphone and some of the things that we had to do to manage drug supply, as well as uh, a lot of medication use criteria for things like inhaled flowland, use of paralytics, DVT prophylaxis, things along those, uh, those lines. Uh, as well as something we did very early on, and I think a lot of institutions adopted this, particularly in the ICUs, was how we were going to utilize infusion pumps outside the room and how we were going to deploy other strategies to minimize PPE burn, uh, such as consolidated medication administration times, guidelines around infusions versus bolus dosing, uh, and things like that. So they were very integrated uh, to the medical teams uh, taking care of these, uh, these large groups of COVID patients across the hospital. Um, they also participated in telemedicine services as patients were discharged from the ICU uh, to continue to follow the patients and, and, and be there for support. Um, one of the things we learned very early on is that had the surge continued around where we were predicted to go, uh, we realized pretty quickly that we need to expand this team. Uh, this team was spending many, many hours a day as these patient populations started to grow. So we started to develop training materials and cross-training uh, for other pharmacists uh, who, who could be prepared uh, to participate in this, in this COVID uh, response team. So that was, that was a big part of our, our realization as well. Along the lines of uh, uh, deployment of, of ADCs and PIXIS, one of the things we also implemented very early, knowing that we were going to be uh, planning for, uh, our, our goal was to plan for a 100% surge, so essentially double the capacity of uh, our hospitals, and in our 900-bed hospital, that of course is no small task. Um, but one of the things we identified very early is we knew we'd be moving into, into areas that aren't typically set up, obviously, for, for necessarily patient care, whether that's places uh, uh, like ambulatory clinics or even gyms and cafeterias and things like that. Uh, one of our strategies was to be ready with what we called our surge PIXIS machines. Essentially, we wanted to have a ICU-built PIXIS set up ready to go and a non-ICU PIXIS set up ready to go. So fully inventoried, uh, essentially ready to roll out of the pharmacy and plug in wherever we needed it. Um, so the goal is to stay ahead of that and keep, keep one of those builds for each of those situations ready to go. And we did that in a couple of ways. Um, we did purchase some new machines, although we were planning on it anyway. But even when we were waiting for those new machines to arrive, uh, we looked at consolidating from other areas and redeploying uh, machines in lower use areas for this purpose so that, you know, whenever we, we had to move patients uh, to an area we weren't used to, uh, to having an inpatient unit, an ICU or a non-ICU, it was essentially ready to go within, within an hour to have medications ready to dispense. Let's stay on this topic a bit, and I'm going to ask um, 
Dave, you and Mike and Russ to weigh in on this because I want to explore some of the challenges around supplies that were non-PPE related. But just looking at our supply chains, we know we were challenged to respond to the demand for critical supplies and medications. We can all agree that the models enable scalable, agile production and optimized distribution based on both the actual and the anticipated needs um, around the response. But my question for um, the pharmacist and Susan, um, please feel free to chime in here as well, is, you know, there's been some publicity that the shortage of key medications to the overall supply chain was a challenge. I'm interested in, from a pharmacy perspective, if you all um, experienced this at your facilities, and if you did, what tools and analytics were available to you via your data to address your clinical stewardship and really tightly manage your med inventory. And um, let's start with you, Russ. Sure, thanks, Kelly. Uh, so, you know, a couple pieces here. Um, you know, from an inventory perspective, uh, we were we were lucky. We were connected. Our hospitals were connected to three different DCs within the McKesson McKesson world, and so we were able to try and leverage each one of the different uh, areas to pull drugs and to see what was available. Uh, but we really put a, a, a group of individuals on point to be looking for the supplies because as ventilator requirements went up, uh, we really needed uh, those ventilator meds, uh, the propothols, the neuromuscular blockers. Um, so, you know, we really had to uh, be very vigilant in ordering them as soon as they became available and making sure that we had uh, the right communications so that each hospital could get their order in, uh, depending on whether the drug was allocated or whether we had... Uh, other restrictions around it. So, um, you know, just that vigilant team and high, high communication to all the buyers was a key point in that, as well as using uh, both, you know, direct to the manufacturer and uh, other ways to, uh, to go after drugs uh, that we've learned through the drug shortage process. So, uh, really, it was an extension of our, our drug shortage process to go after it. But, uh, you know, the other piece that we really needed to work with on this was just keeping up with the new trends and, uh, you know, there were so many new clinical guidelines that came out of, you know, all of a sudden we were ordering one drug because that was the hot new drug to go after. And, uh, you know, we really had to keep up clinically with this, uh, especially at the start of the COVID, because things were changing rapidly. And, uh, you know, the new keeping those supportive drugs and then any new uh, drug that was coming out in the literature on, on staff or on uh, in, in the hospitals was very important. So, it was uh, definitely a push um, to uh, to keep that going. Um, so that and then uh, keeping up with the CDC with uh, PPE. So really making sure that we had the right PPE guidelines um, so that we could uh, conserve and keep the pharmacists in there with social comfort masks at times. And then uh, if they were patient facing, making sure they had the right PPE along with that as well. So. Um, staying up to date, high communication was really our key to success here. Great. And Mike, I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on this topic. And, and, and also, did you work with any of the agencies that, that Russ mentioned in order to maintain your supply chain or, or to get medications that you weren't able to get through traditional channels? But I'm curious to your perspective, Mike. Yeah, I would say one of the things that we had the luxury of is really relying upon uh, a number of the experiences of our colleagues on the East Coast who um, certainly saw the, the first surge uh, inundate their facilities and really keeping track um, and really kudos to them for being for taking the time out of their already hectic schedule to be able to comment within different listservs via ASHP or other organizations with what they were seeing. And, and I think what was most valued to us was sharing the metrics regarding the different drug utilization patterns, particularly with ventilated COVID patients, uh, because they were different than what we historically see from utilization perspective with non-COVID ventilation patients. So that really helped us as we went through and overall evaluated our inventory levels and then what we did internally is, is we used, you know, a lot of the tools that we have with regards to Pixis Logistics from an inventory management perspective, as well as P Pixis ES, um, in addition to the, the inventory optimization analytics, to be able to make calculations based upon what we had. And we made each of our 35 facilities report their inventory for meds that we deemed as critical twice a week. 
And then what we did is based upon um, some of the initial experiences on the East Coast as well as of some of our own initial experience with, with the patients that we had, is we built in um, different numbers of days of therapy on hand as well as overall number of patient treatment courses we could complete within the organization for each individual medication. Um, and then we actually worked with our informatics group to be able to plug that into the faith page of our incident command centers dashboard so that we had complete visibility um, to all of our administrative leaders as well as all of our providers with an up-to-date of how much of each different medication that we could have. Certainly, we also collaborated very closely with our infectious disease and critical care colleagues as we developed our different effective treatment protocols um, that, again, is, as Russ mentioned, continue to evolve throughout all of this, which was really, really crucial. We also closely collaborated um, with our GPO as well as our, our preferred wholesale vendor um, and then really worked closely with a number of different um, manufacturers to be able to update them on what our volumes were and really be able to get product based upon the number of, of COVID patients that we were treating. Um, we took a number of different conservative measures um, up front as a way to be able to protect some of our, you know, larger vial sizes or larger product sizes such as propofol and fentanyl and things like that. So really in preparation for the surge. So we tried to be as proactive as we could um, to be able to conserve what medications we knew that we would essentially need when we would become really busy uh, with COVID patients. Thanks for that. And I want to just check in with Susan or Dave to see if you have anything to add to the insights provided by um, Russ and Mike um, from your perspective in New York. I mean, I, this is so I would say, um, you know, we did have a similar um, situation where we developed, we actually, as part of the initial work of our incident command center, um, we put together what we thought was going to be the critical COVID list very early in the process and started to um, monitor what the burn rates were of the drugs. And to Mike's point, you know, this, this disease, this, this uh, syndrome or this, this COVID was something so different than anything that any of us had ever experienced with um, the different waves of the type of the illness. So the initial wave and then the ARDS wave and then the cytokine storm and then the thrombosis. Um, so it really was, I kept calling it pharmacy whack-a-mole. We didn't know which drug it was that they were going to be looking at at any given day. Um, and we had so many different researchers in our system that we were trying to keep touch with, keep track of what their research was that they were doing as far as the, the investigational drug protocols. Um, that was another big, um, I think, one of the good things that we did early on is we started sending pharmacy teams to attend all those different work groups so that we could keep our pulse on what was going on with, for example, the, the myeloma team that was giving guidance on the cytokine storm, the cardiovascular team that was doing the thrombotic work, the um, ICU team that was doing a lot around um, the proning and, and the issues with the amount of sedation that was necessary for our patients. Um, I think it was so early on in the process that um, that FEMA and, and others didn't believe in our wholesalers and our GPO, didn't believe the burn rates of the drugs that we were using. So we started doing data collection with our data collection teams um, to prove that at the patient level so that we had some validity to what we were claiming as far as our needs for the drugs for those patients. Um, early on, we reached out directly. So um, one of my team members, um, Joe Pinto, who's you know well well vested in New York, he's been in New York a long time and very involved in our New York um, pharmacy governance, uh, developed a group of folks that met New York City pharmacy leaders, and we added on as time went on to different people that attended. So we opened it up to Greater New York and all of the New York State eventually. Um, we started meeting every day about what our issues were uh, at 5 o'clock in the evening, and um, we were able to bring on representation from um, from American Society of Health System Pharmacists. So ASHP joined us. Um, our local um, board of pharmacy joined us. Um, eventually, we got um, we were able to get somebody from the FDA to join us to listen to what we were going through every day, and that was really helpful in that they were able to connect us with um, some partners that we hadn't worked with before. So we did more direct 
um, from manufacturer ordering, they were able to give us um, extended use on some short date drugs that we could get get use you know get use of right away. We reached out to the FDA or to the DEA to see if they would loosen up on um, the production for of fentanyl and other C2s because we were getting really really short. Um, and we reached out to USP to see what we could do if they could make any guidelines or recommendations so that we could avoid the waste of use of drugs. Um, so, you know, I think um, the other thing that we really worried about early on was the PPE. So we pivoted and started looking at other opportunities to use some reusable PPE um, in our pharmacy clean room so that we could save some of, of the other PPE for those patients or the, the providers that were patient facing. Um, so I think, you know, it made, um, I think the collaboration of pharmacy teams across New York, for example, meeting with some of the government agencies and really getting our voice heard was really important early on. And then, you know, kudos to, to folks like um, Arash and other folks from um, NYU that made sure that they started publishing an ASHP um, so that everybody knew what was going on because we knew that it was going to come rolling down the hill to our friends everywhere in the States. And, and we wanted to make sure that we were able to, you know, communicate that um, as soon as possible. Thanks, Susan. I, I want to pivot our conversation towards the future. And this has impacted our world in so many ways. How do we in healthcare recover? And I'm interested first to hear from everyone about your plans to get back to normal or the new normal and how your organizations are reaching out to your patient communities. Um, your populations um, for care and how you're going to resume normal care. And Becky, I'm going to start with you because I think data plays an important point, but I also um, am interested in what your organizations are doing from a PR perspective to let the public know um, that you're open for business and um, when it's appropriate, it's safe to come back for care. So Becky, let's start with you. Sure. So. So as you mentioned, you know, data I think is the key driver. So everyone everyone agrees that we wanted to number one provide safe care, number two keep our teammates safe, and number three make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure that our communities are safe. So in doing that, we have continued to share with the public like we are still here and you can get great care through virtual services. That virtual services didn't end. It, it will continue on and we're continuing to market and message to that that there are easy ways that you can still do your routine uh, checkups, get your meds refilled, have a touch point, have a visual connection with your provider. Um, if you do need to come in and see a provider, we also have taken steps and like many organizations so that instead of having you wait in a waiting room, we can have you wait in your car. We have a texting capability with you so that we can tell you, okay, now is the time to come in. And then, of course, have put all of the appropriate six-foot distancing, you know, a lot of cleaning uh, processes in place, plexiglass, all of those different initiatives, like many businesses in our, in our um, community have done. Um, so we've done those same efforts. And then, of course, resuming surgeries was another thing. So if someone was had a shoulder surgery, for example, that they were planning to do this, and that, of course, the the pandemic really started and that their elective surgery got canceled, we have specifically um, organized that those patients, you know, we test those patients prior to them coming in. Um, we are making sure that we're doing a lot more education on the front end so that they're making sure that they're having a safe experience and then, can, you know, can come in as we're open for business. So we haven't, you know, none of us, you know, stopped doing business. We're just doing it a little bit differently now. And we want our community to hear that we're in partnership with doing that. The other thing that we're doing is, um, you know, not every location, for example, in the Charlotte market can get to a testing site. And so, you know, are there areas of greater need in Charlotte or, or surrounding communities? And so we're taking the testing sites to those locations. And that changes based upon what the data shows. So if we see that the east side of Charlotte is struggling um, and that we, we see a surge, we will actually take the testing site to that location um, to better help serve and, and educate and communicate and make an impact on those communities. So we're really trying to message out all of these different efforts that we're doing. Probably the next big thing that we're looking at too is how do we change the visitation policy? 
you know, uh, instantly we had to really be protective of our patients and instantly we had to be protective of our staff by not having visitors in the organization. We've now relaxed that and so we have visitors that are allowed for different scenarios, whether um, three of the, of the entire time, if you were having a baby, you could have someone with you. If you were, um, but now when we have surgery, you can have someone with you. We're looking at how do we leverage technology to make sure that people can still touch base with the family members, whether that's in the ICU or on the units with iPads. But at the same time, we're looking at how do we keep those visitors safe as we continue to reopen and change and really, you know, I hate calling it the new normal because it's just going to be what it is. And um, it is the new normal. I, I don't think anybody's ever going to say it like this is normal, but, but it is going to be the new way that we do things and that we're here for our community and we want them to come back um, because we know that there are immediate needs out there that are not being met and, and we want to make sure we're here for our patients. And I'm sure, you know, um, Susan's probably had the same type of experience of how do you reach back out to the communities and I know we've talked a little bit in our group here um, about those activities so I'll, t I'll turn it over to them to add some additional things that they've done. Becky I'm going to jump in here real quick because nursing you know is is really delivering care in in new and in challenging ways and um, we depend upon our colleagues in the clinical realm to help support that. I just want to check in with maybe Russ um, and Susan and Mike and Dave. Quick question around one of the things that has emerged from this where nursing relies on pharmacy heavily is on clinical trials. I'm curious how um, the pharmacy colleagues on this call and on the panel, how did you um, manage and streamline your clinical trials for COVID specific care? Um, I'm curious because I'm sure this is the new fast track has never been fast tracked like like this but I'm curious how um, the pharmacy managed the clinical trial element of medication management during this time this is Mike I can speak a little bit to our experiences um, so I, I'd say the biggest impact that we did from a clinical trials perspective is um, our pharmacists that we have dedicated to to our typical clinical trials activities um, their presence became uh, a lot sig more significant than I think a lot of uh, a lot of us are used to but we really needed to rely on their expertise to be able to stand up um, a number of these different trials to make sure that we were certainly functioning in the correct capacity, but also engaging everyone appropriately by providing, um, you know, as real-time education and operational support to make sure that we were following the specific protocols as best as we could. Um, we merged um, a lot of what's typically our, our research group with our um, clinical pearls team that we stood up to make sure that those two groups um, had a consistent agenda um, so that, that they could move forward in a collaborative manner um, which is something that oftentimes um, they they kind of operate in their own independent areas so I think um, really the ability to collaborate and educate um, as close to real time as we could was very very beneficial Yeah, this is Sue. I think, you know, we, um, the first thing we did is we were inundated with so many trials from so many different pharma companies. So we said that init initially the decision was made that all the trial requests were going to be funneled through um, one team of our, of our IRB and um, one team of clinicians, and it was led up by our chief of infectious diseases. So um, that small team I think it was 12 people would vet every study in an expeditious way so that we could help to triage those. Anytime that a patient was entered in a trial or to get entered into a trial, you had to have an infectious disease consult. Um, and the infectious disease teams were rounding um, on the vast majority of the patients in the hospital. It obviously became too much work for them to see physically see everybody, but they were triaged by the ICU teams. Um, we also really leaned heavily on our antimicrobial stewardship team, our ASP team, um, which a pharmacist is, there are several pharmacists at each site that are members mm -hmm. on that. Um, so the ASP pharmacist really provided a lot of oversight. We also leaned really heavily on um, our chief ASP pharmacist at the big hospital. Um, and she worked closely with 
our infectious disease team, um, as well as the COVID management team to develop a protocol um, that was, it was a, updated on a regular basis. It was posted everywhere, and, um, built within EPIC as an EPIC protocol. Um, but it, there was a physical visio of the protocol where you could look through to see when you had a patient um, at what point in the decision tree they might be eligible for a trial. And then it would quickly in this document describe which trial they might be um, eligible for. And it would also show if you put a patient onto one arm of a trial, what other drugs they might then not qualify to get. So for example, early on, um, we had covalescent plasma really early at Sinai. If you got covalescent plasma, I think it excluded you from some of the remdesivir trials. So, or tocilizumab trials. So early on, you know, you had to make a decision of which trial route you wanted to go to. And then those were, as everyone on this call knows, changing every day. So we were updating those protocols. Um, and then we needed updates for, for pregnancy, for example, or for pediatric patients. Um, so really to funnel that through one team that was largely driven by the antimicrobial stewardship team um, that was really led by both ID and pharmacists was um, really key and critical. Um, and those folks were really at the helm 24-7. Thanks, Susan. We're, we're getting close to the end of our time, so I just want to remind the audience that you can um, submit questions online. Please do so. Um, we want to spend about five minutes or so um, addressing your questions and areas of interest. For our panel, um, as we start to move towards wrapping up, I'm just curious, you know, health systems have been pivoting. We've all mentioned that today to prioritize how we deliver care. And you've all mentioned examples of an unprecedented level of co cooperation in collaboration um, with some non-traditional partners. So as we close today, I would like all of you to just share maybe a quick impression, um, a minute or so about what did you learn and what are your key takeaways and what would you say about your organization's um, response to your communities of care during the pandemic? Um, and let's start with you, Russ. Sure, thanks. Uh, so, you know, some of the things that I learned from this really was a standpoint of uh, better understanding how the whole organization worked together. I've been here about two years. And so really got the chance to dig in and see how a lot of great leaders work together and uh, was, it was able to be a part of that. Everything from uh, code, code Blue teams and reorganize, reorganizing that to, uh, to medications and how we distribute those better within the organization. But uh, you know, really got to uh, learn a lot about the organization and, uh, and be a part of a lot of great work. But uh, communication was the key as well as uh, keeping our priorities straight. And uh, you know, both priorities around COVID and then around keeping other things going on because with all the work that was went into COVID, we literally had to start making meetings that were non-COVID meetings so that we could keep the other work of pharmacy moving and that we didn't lose track of things. And so by prioritizing that and then creating a space where we could talk about non-COVID uh, pieces that uh, really helped us, uh, or non-COVID projects really helped us continue to move both, uh, both works forward. Great. Mike, how about you? I think a couple different things. I think similar to what Russ mentioned, I think it really allowed us um, to think more as an organization rather than as individual departments. I think from an awareness perspective, uh, we learned a tremendous, about e tremendous amount about each other and really how what goes into the overall successful functioning of each other departments and how does that all combine to make a successful organization. So, you know, we made a lot of mention about, you know, the benefits of telemedicine and the benefits of, you know, our, our home care group and being able to take care of COVID positive patients in their homes to be able to prevent them from coming into the hospitals and learning about what impacts their day to day and what tools they need to be successful, I think is, has left us all with just a better understanding of what all it truly takes to make our organization successful. Um, I think the biggest thing that, that we really learned is, and that we ex exhibited is really the building of trust. And I say the building of trust and that everyone that you encounter is really in that day is 
is acting it with the best intentions and doing the best they can to take care of all of our patients. And I think that this oftentimes gets lost in, in some of our day-to-day -day activities, but I think that because we were so inundated and everything was changing is that we really had to assume the best in everyone else and all of our colleagues. And I think that that ultimately brought us um, a lot closer. Uh, I think we're a lot closer knit organization than we were probably six months ago. Um, and I really hope and, and think that that will continue to, to help us continue um, some forward momentum that we've created as we all have a better understanding of really um, how each of us plays a vital role in our organization's sustainability. Susan, how about you? You know, there's communication and trust were the two words that I wrote. I think the other thing is uh, appreciation and gratitude. Um, so, you know, appreciation of our team members for their efforts um, has been ex that's been expressed in that trust. Um, and then really a gratitude for um, every day. And, you know, we started playing, I think a lot of health systems did stuff like that. We started playing the song, Here Comes the Sun, every time a patient got off the ventilator. I think we all developed a new sense of gratitude for health and life and um, the ability to care for people and the ability to see over the other side of the mountain. Um, and that we trusted each other implicitly. There was no time to waste and there was so much work. Everyone had to trust that everyone else was going to do whatever needed to be done. Um, and that was a good feeling that there was no uh, there was no arm wrestling over ownership. It was just trust and do your best and get it done um, and have faith tomorrow is going to be better. Becky, thank you for rec for representing the nursing community and the informatics community. Interested in your um, perspective as we wrap up. Yeah, I think I think Susan said it, it best there that um, everyone in this experience has developed some really um, have had to focus on trusting their colleagues um, because we don't have time to waste and decisions need to made, be made quickly. And so what I've um, appreciated is the grace that and the understanding or I should say letting go of things being perfect. So even though maybe the report wasn't exactly 100% what we needed, but it got 80% of the data there, then that was the right direction to move on. And instead of reflecting on, oh, well, how could we have made it, you know, 20% better? Or we should have done X, Y, Z. We don't even waste our time on that anymore. And now it just says, we're going to now take that and this is how we are going to improve that or move it along. And so what I've seen in our culture is that we trust each other. So if we have an ICU critical care expert and they need X, Y, Z, then they need X, Y, Z, and we need to do whatever we can to help support that. If we have a decision that needs to be made, what you know historically would have taken weeks to, to make and maybe 100 people involved, now we're going to have to do, use five people and make that decision in 18 hours. But we know that those five people are committed, that we trust them, they're going to use the best skills that they have, and that will be the best decision we make at that time. And then we will continue to pivot and iterate as needed to make sure that we're doing the best thing for our clinicians and our patients and our communities. And so that's what I, I'm hopeful that those kind of things will stick long after COVID is resolved, that we have this new appreciation for we can trust in each other, we can learn from other organizations, and then we can move things along. I mean, we had, um, for example, we put in a COVID dashboard because we wanted to give our clinicians the ability to see the progress of a patient. And again, hearing of those apocalyptic experiences from New York, New Jersey, and California, we knew that this would be valuable information. And so we turned to some other um, hospital organizations that were a couple weeks ahead of us. And again, just taking that example, we took exactly what they told us to do. We didn't question it. We put, because they had already iterated on it, and we took their great lessons and put it in place and found it to be really effective. Um, so that's what I'm really hopeful, is that everyone will continue to build trust in our great clinicians and leaders in healthcare organizations and share those lessons learned and, and really grow and make things better for everybody in the future. Thanks, Becky. And um, I'm interested in the final thought of Dave. Dave, I put you in a very difficult position to, to be the last one, the grand finale, if you will, but interested in any perspectives you want to share from the Rochester community. 
Yeah, all of, uh, yeah, that is a tough position after all that wonderful wonderful <laughs> stuff that was said. I, I agree completely with everything. You know, the trust in each other, um, the communication was so important. But you know, one of the things that was touched on that that I think is also important to remember is just it was incredible to see how much all of our our teams and clinicians supported each other both in work because we all worked long days and still working long days and hours and helping each other out. Um, and that idea that, that we work together, there's no time for silos, there's no departmental conflicts around how, you know, whether we get something done, it's how do we do it. I think that was very impressive. But also supporting each other outside of work was also very critical uh, and something we can't overlook and, and even going forward. You know, a quick check-in with people, um, a lot of Zoom happy hours, things like that going on. Uh, those things are so important uh, because, you know, people are, are living this uh, both inside of work and outside of work. And I think keeping that in mind and, and, and supporting each other was really important. Thank you so much. And just as a reminder to our audience, we are going to go over a little bit so we can address some of your questions. Um, you can submit online, so there's still time to do that. And we've received um, quite a few during the course of our discussion today. So let's go ahead and shift the conversation to the audience questions. And I'm going to start with one that deals with digital health. Um, I think several of you, if not all of you, have mentioned telehealth, remote monitoring, paramedicine. I'm just curious, what is your perspective on the adoption of digital health tools and the impact of COVID-19 on their relevance moving forward, even as COVID-19 starts to subside? So any thoughts or impressions or any initiatives already underway um, around the where digital health fits within our continuums of care? Yeah, this is uh, this is Dave Webster from U of R. We um, we were already, you know, like like a lot of places, very very much uh, invested in telemedicine and telehealth uh, before COVID. But it became such a critical part in so many ways of of reaching back out to patients during the crisis and even today as as the crisis continues. Um, you know, it was a big part of maintaining our ambulatory uh, touch with patients. Uh, checking in with them, we we were able to maintain about 55 to 60 percent of our ambulatory visits uh, solely using telemedicine uh, when, when we weren't able to see them in the clinic. So that was a huge part of it. It's also a huge part of the recovery to get back to 100 percent visits, whether that was shared between uh, in-person visits and telemedicine. Uh, but of course, we learned what a lot of places learned early on. Number one, we have to be we need the infrastructure to manage this. We were in a pretty good position, but did identify we needed to, to uh, strengthen our infrastructure around providing telemedicine, as well as getting information to patients uh, on how to do that. You know, we, we can't just assume everybody knows the right way to connect or how to connect. So we used a lot of tools from public service announcements, marketing, uh, to the My, uh, MyChart uh, tools with an Epic to send information out to patients and make sure they were comfortable connecting. And what we found is a lot of patients really prefer that, uh, decreased commute, commute times. Um, you know, we, we didn't see a lot of cancellations. We saw a pretty strong response. So going forward, we're hoping that this becomes part of, of our toolbox uh, in how we reach out to patients. Of course, reimbursement will have to change, and that's all the things that, you know, we're working on now. Um, as, it, as it isn't uh, nearly as, as uh, financially advantageous to do telemedicine visits, we're hoping that changes over time. Any other perspectives from the panel? Um, I'll just add that, you know, this is where the continued use of um, creativity also needs to come in place. You know, you know, Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I, I'm sure many of us have had to say, okay, even though we would normally wouldn't do this, let's try it now because we don't really have any other options. And I'm hoping, though, that some of that innovative aspects will continue. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we had nurses nurses in New York were trying baby monitors, and we saw that innovation, and then we embraced that and, and leveraged that. But at the same time, we have to look at ways, you know, how do we do virtual visits into the patient's room so that they don't have to go in? How do, what other technologies can we put at different places so that don't require a human intervention? Um, and yet at the same time, what things do we need to put in place to enhance the patient experience? 
So I am, um, you know, I think that that's what we're looking at too is where do we need to continue to invest in our innovation and in this invest in technology and some of the regulations have lifted in that. So to me, there's this window that we can actually trial out some of those things, whether you've got an uh, Alexa or a Google or a Siri or whomever in the room or in the ambulatory setting or anywhere that the patient can, that you can get to them. Um, and provide health care, I think that this is the opportunity for us to to look at that. And, and hopefully all of the organizations, you know, across the United States and around the world are getting breathing room to, to gather that, and hopefully that will help lead, lead progress ahead. Yeah, th this right. is Sue. I think, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to add, I, I think the one thing that we're, uh, we have, we're already working on that we're going to get a lot more into because of this is the remote patient monitoring and chronic care management. So a lot of our ambulatory pharmacists really morphed into um, doing a lot more telehealth visits and, and doing outreach directly to patients at home. Um, and we're really seeing the benefits of providing that um, direct care in the home. And maybe it's because people were home to take calls, but um, it's just being able to do things like the remote page of monitoring with things like blood pressure cuffs and whatnot um, is the kind of thing we want to move towards because we know this will help us provide uh, more continuous care, um, whether the patients come in virtually or in person. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to get to another question, and this one um, is with regard to infection prevention. And just curious, with your facility starting to open back up and also you have elective procedures that are starting up, we have that going on. And then we see um, places like the Joint Commission um, requiring us to maintain certain levels of compliance and on infection prevention. So one of the audience mem members would like the panel to discuss if you have any plans um, to expedite, improve, expand your infection prevention um, programs? Are you working um, on your analytics in a different, expanded way around infection prevention? And any other information you might like to share around um, IP? I know within our organization with all the different, uh, I mean, all the heightened awareness that we've had for infection prevention and control, just with regards to COVID is our overall, you know, infection rates per capita per patient have significantly decreased. So I think it's it's really caused us to probably go back and evaluate a lot of our traditional practices um, because we've, you know, in trying to find that happy medium or that reasonable place where we can live in the future. Um, but ultimately, I think we're probably going to learn a few things by some of the changes in practice that we've implemented because of this. Um, with regards to accreditation organizations such as the Joint Commission and other items, I think they're going to, their, their hand's going to be forced just like ours has been is to be continue to evaluate what have been our traditional practices and modify them to make sure that they maintain relevancy. And I think that you know, as accreditation bodies, for them to, to maintain that relevancy, they're going to need to be adaptable and innovative, um, just like we are. Final so, question um, from, I'm sorry, go ahead. Kelly, I was just going to add, so the one other thing I'll just share with you from an infection prevention perspective that we're looking at, I'm sure many organizations are, just again, how do you continue to protect your teammates? So as the um, various technology expands and the regulations join that with contact tracing, um, symptom checking versus symptom tracking, how do you, you know, how, I think that there will be a big swell in that technology as well. Um, you know, historically some of the RFID tags you know, are just really expensive. They require a lot of beacons, you know. So I think there's a lot of more dialogue that's going to continue to have in that infection space to say if a patient did come in and did was COVID positive, who were they all around or not? And how do we continue to put efforts forward to protect not only the staff, but other patients, visitors, et cetera? Thanks, Becky. And we have time for one more question, and this one was specifically for Russ. Um, and the audience member wanted to hear more about your engagement with the State Board of Pharmacy and if 
they required you to have a state waiver at all, or what were some of the specific requirements to operate or any other insights you could share around engaging with the state board at this time? Uh, sure. So the state board uh, here at Arizona actually gave uh, several meetings that we could go in and uh, express issues around or concerns that we had around the, the COVID time period and changes that needed to be made. Um, so a lot of it was done through uh, notes from the, or minutes from the meetings um, is how they communicated those things out and the, the changes. But, uh, you know, allowing us to have uh, technician supervision remotely was a, a big piece of this, um, allowing, uh, you know, clarifying that we could use our sterile compounding pharmacy to um, to make uh, the alcohol solution or the uh, hand wash, um, san hand sanitizer. Um, so, you know, just uh, working with the state board to clarify regulations and then also to get uh, some some waivers or some uh, ability to work outside or, or stretch the, the current regulations around uh, supervision requirements. Um, so a lot of it was, uh, you know, truly writing in and uh, explaining our case and then having them uh, communicate back through the minutes of their meetings or being in those meetings. Thanks, Russ. And we've gone over today, but I think it was well worth it. We had a lot of great dialogue and a lot of great questions from the audience. So if we didn't answer your question, we'll try to get back to you if we can. Um, I would like to thank the audience for your attendance today. And once again, um, let our panelists know how much we appreciate you stepping away from the critical activities that you support um, in the interest of sharing information with our clinician community of practice. So thank you very much, everyone, and this concludes our call. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks.